and welcome to Landscape Photography World, the podcast for everyone passionate about landscape photography. I'm Grant Swinburne and I'll be your host on the show talking to landscape photographers about their motivations, likes and dislikes. This podcast is sponsored by Syncback Pro, the professional photographer's tool to keep your images safe. How safe are your photographs? Or to put it this way, how would you feel if you permanently lost some or even all of them? The fact is, there are very real risks in storing your digital images on a hard drive, even if they're backed up to an external device. There's ransomware, hardware failure, file corruption, virus infection, and even accidental deletion or destruction. Syncback Pro makes this problem go away permanently. Syncback Pro is the professional photographer's tool to back up photographs, images, documents, and data files. Once set up, it keeps your files safe, quietly and reliably in the background. So if problems occur or disaster strikes, you'll have nothing to worry about. Your photographs will be safe. Which is why it's also the backup solution that I use myself for my own photographs. Take advantage of an exclusive 25% discount today by going to www.backup.sg. The software will never expire, meaning your photographs are safe forever. That's www.backup.sg. Give your photographs the protection they deserve. And now, on with the show. Paul Belli has been photographing landscapes and seascapes since 2018. Originally from Scotland, he's now well and truly settled in New Zealand and loves having the opportunity to shoot some of the most stunning scenery in the world. His style has changed quite a bit in those four short years. He's always shot long exposure photography, but continues pushing boundaries with the length of exposures he's taking, taking a deep dive into the realms of ultra-long exposure photography. His first love is taking photographs of the sea, probably in part from the love of having his feet in the ocean. To Paul, it's very cathartic. Being surrounded by natural beauty in New Zealand, Paul uses his camera as an extension of how he sees the landscape, and then prints his photos with a focus on the magic he finds. Earlier this year, he won the Cityscape category in the Landscape Photography World Awards, and he's going to keep pushing the boundaries of his craft. We talk about where his creative drive comes from, how he balances having a young family with his passion for astrophotography, and what success in his photography means to him, along with a lot more. I hope you enjoy the show. Hi, Paul. Welcome to Landscape Photography World. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good, Grant. Thanks so much for having me. It's an absolute honour and pleasure to be here. Oh, thank you. Uh, been wanting to talk to you for a little while, and I know we've uh, chatted a bit on uh, Twitter and um, social media and so, so forth. Why don't you tell people what it is that you do and why you do it? No, I've been thinking because I've been listening to your podcast and I've, I've come up with a name for your question, usually your first question as well. And I've called it the, the cannonball question because it's hard and fast. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I guess I, I'd primarily call myself a seascape, sort of landscape slash landscape photographer. Sure. Um, I, I'd, I'd try not to pigeonhole myself if that's possible, but it's what I love to do. I love to get my feet wet and, you know, stand in the ocean. Yep. But I do I do like to dabble. Um recently I've been dabbling quite a lot more with um, astrophotography. I've had a little stint and kick at macro photography. I've tried deep sky photography and without a tracker and a decent tripod, that was just yeah, it was that was pointless. That yeah. didn't last long. Um I'm kind of a type of photographer, I guess, that he'll see something that's quite unique. And it will sort of like flick something over in his brain. Mm -hmm. And it'll, I'll think about it and I'll mull over it, maybe for some time. And at some point, it will come back to me again. I'll be like, I really want to try that style. And I'll, I'll all of a sudden, you know, I'm not doing landscapes and seascapes anymore. I'm off trying this out, trying out this new, uh, this new style and new technique. But sure. yeah, I'd say seascapes primarily. Okay. So how did you get started in seascaping or, you know, in, in photography in general? Photography, it's actually through YouTube. Um, I've always been fascinated with the night sky ever since I was a kid in Scotland, looking up at because we had great clear skies, you know, when the clouds weren't there and it wasn't obviously, you know, raining quite hard, thunderstorms, whatnot. Um, just looking up at the clear, you know, those clear night skies and it was it was fascinating to me. So astrophotography was actually the first venture that I went into. 
Mm -hmm. um, and that was just through watching people like Astro Backyard and watching his videos early on. You know, this is like early, late 2017, maybe early 2018. Sure, sure. Um, and I thought, oh, I really want to give this a go. Um, and that's when I started looking into, okay, well, like I'm on a budget. What kind of camera can I maybe look into getting into that would give me some decent reach into the night sky? Um, and I ended up getting just a standard Panasonic point and shoot. I think it was like a DMC Z F Z seventy or something like that. Oh, but the that. thing that the thing that caught my eye was the seventy times, no, sorry, the sixty times optical zoom. Okay. Yeah. And um, my wife reminded me of a time where we took the camera on Valentine's Day, and we we're on this you know Bastion Point down Mission Bay in Auckland, and we're looking over the over the Waitemata Harbour. And we're looking across to the other side of the harbour and we're using the zoom in, uh, full 60 uh, times zoom. And I'm like, oh my God, look, look how far we can zoom in. Like, we can see young people on the other side of the, you know, the other side of the harbour. This is amazing. This is going to be great for astrophotography. It wasn't. It wasn't. <laughs> so that was, that was where I started. And that's the, that was my first camera. It was just a standard digital point and shoot camera, you know. Yeah. How did things develop from there? What pushed you beyond? Was it the fact that you sort of tried and failed with the 60 times Zoom to do Astro? <laughs> or was it, and you said, all right, well, I need to do something different? Or <laughs> Well, because, yeah, well, maybe, I should, yeah, exactly. I was I was starting to look into, um, I guess, other, other photographers. You know, you, when you watch YouTube, other recommendations come up. Yeah. So then you start seeing the Nick Page and the Michael Shane Bloom, and these these guys start popping up in your feed. And of course, these guys do amazing astrophotography themselves, but they also do amazing landscape, woodland photography, and you know everything else under under the sun. So I was starting to sort of watch those guys as well. I was like, you know, I love the the landscape, I love the seascape, I love as I say, I love putting my feet in the ocean, and it just sort of made sense that oh, I might actually give this a go and test my camera and start trying to do some 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 seascaping you know practice some long exposure photography so oh. that's where it came a cropper with this camera unfortunately because um as i found out to my detriment and i didn't know this beforehand because i didn't study the specs the camera only had a maximum limit of an eight second exposure it couldn't yeah. go beyond that yep I even I even emailed Panasonic just saying, oh look, have you got like a firmware update or something that can extend this? Like, like you know, you can that. can you like can you like put a like a bulb mode into this camera for me or something, anything? Um so I was quite uh, quite limited in what the camera could do as far as this lot the long exposures. I mean, that's not to say, as you know, you can't get amazing long exposure at half a second or a second, you know, you know, whatever it may be. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, but I was just really bought into smoothing out, you know, when I first saw that, you know, the long exposure, the ultra long exposure, I like to call it, um, that complete smoothing out of the water. I was like, I was enamored, you know, I was like, oh, I really want to do that. And eight seconds just, with, you know, especially with a rough sea. Just not long enough. Yeah. Just wasn't doing it. Yeah, it just wasn't doing it. Yeah, so I had to... Um, we took that camera actually on um, Chloe's graduation down to Dunedin because, mm -hmm. you know, South Island, you know, it's a, it's a landscape photographer's paradise. Absolutely. Um, so we took that camera down there and I just, yeah, I really struggled with its limitations down there. But I mean, we had some lovely hot spots around uh, Wanaka and Queenstown um, and I got some pretty decent shots, but like I was amateur eyes. I look back at some of those shots and it's, it's, you know, you just you look at the you look at some old shots, just like, oh God, that's cringe. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we all cringe at our yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I know I've got a couple of nice ones out of my point and shoots, hmm. but it would be like one, one, yep. several thousand. <laughs> yeah. Oh, look. I mean, if I got my hands on, um, it's, and it's still around somewhere. I think it's. I think um, my wife's sister has it. If I got my hands on it again, I have no doubt I could make full, you know, knowing what I know now, you know, this is five years ago, like five, five years further down the track, of course, you know, like, you know, knowing what I know now, I have no doubt I could make better use of it. But again, you know, it was first camera and it was just learning the real, you know, I hadn't even gone into like composition side of things. I was just so keen and eager just to get, get the camera out. All right, let's go into like full eight second exposure. Let's just you know see what we can make, and it was just, it was all crap. <laughs> so, 
how did you feel that intervening sort of five years between then and now? Have you, how did you learn your craft and what was it that sort of drove you to, to do that? That, you know, as much as I guess I failed in the early days, it only spurred me on because the, the world of photography is just is so vast and so huge and there's so many genres that you can sort of dive in, you know, deep dive into, you know. But And I really wanted to, you know, after that experience down the South Island, I was like, okay, I really want to deep dive into uh, landscape and seascape specifically, that style of photography. I understood the limitations of my camera and that's when I started to look at, you know, finally getting a DSLR. Yeah. Um, so I did, you know, probably a little bit longer than it, than it should have taken for me to get that DSLR, but I finally got one and I got it secondhand. I got it for $200 with yep. its kit lens. It's 18 to 55 mil kit lens. Yep. It was just an Icon D5200. I've still got it. And it's in that, I don't know if you ever saw them when they brought them out. And uh, it's that really sort of like bright cherry red. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's quite, it's not, the, it's not, I don't think it's, a, you know, it's not really a fitting car. Anyway, um, so it's quite a, it's quite a Larry camera. Um, so, yeah, but that gave me then the opportunity to experiment more. Yep. Um, I can go into ball mode, I can get shutter release and, you know, this, that, and the next thing. I started watching more and more YouTube tutorials, uh, started learning more around um, compositional techniques, you know, rule of thirds, you know, golden triangle, golden, sorry, golden ratio, all that kind of stuff. Yep. Yep. Um, and then trying to put that into practice. But when I, when I first started and I was first going out to these, you know, like especially around my local area, like, you know, we've got amazing um, magma formation rocks from Rangi Toto, which sits right in the Hauraki Gulf here in Auckland. Yep. It last blew up like 800 years ago or something like that, but we've got like the remnants of the, you know, the, the what's it called, igneous rock. Yep. Um, and they make, and I've taken quite a few shots using that as a foreground feature and then rang it all in the background. Um, but it's like, again, I still wasn't grasping the, the basics of composition balance. You yeah. know, I'd have too much foreground, not enough sky or vice versa. Um, and that was that was probably the steepest learning curve for me was was really nailing I guess the basics and 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 not and trying to tone back the the excitement and the enthusiasm of I've just got to click the shutter release at thirty seconds and and see what see what the water looks like I was so fascinated with slowing that water down and just getting that milky look you know everything kind of went out the window but you know the more you do it you know the the, the you know the more calm you the more composed you become the more you start to slow down. And take the scene in, um, and, and you you take that time then to really, you know, peruse the the environment you're in. You know, looking left and right. You know, I'll look over here, I'll look over there, and I'll see what foreground really suits uh, what's happening in the background. And if I want to try, you know, and how I, how I balance those two things out, with obviously the water being the feature, depending on what of you know, as you know, you know, um, how fast do you want to slow the water down. You know, if you've got like really great waves, you don't really want to smooth them out too much. If it's just a flat cam C with a couple of waves rolling through, it doesn't really matter. But if you've got crashing waves, you want to, you know, you want to stop that and capture that detail. Yeah, some some opportunity that you get, you really want to make sure that you're taking advantage of the the height of the waves as mm. opposed to flattening it at everything. Yeah. Else. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. But flattened out storm waves don't look quite as impressive. It's a, it's a bit silly. <laughs> it's a wee bit silly. That's it. And I find I mean I finally moved on from that uh, 5200 and moved into what I would class as my professional realm camera which was the D500 still sticking with Nikon. Yep. Um, and the, and the reason I got I got the D500 when I was looking at um, cameras to you know the next evolution in my camera was because of the, the shutter speed, because it could take up to, I think it was nine frames per second. Because at that point then as well, for a few years further down the track, I was starting to look into bird photography and I was really starting to enjoy taking, you know, photographs of the, the birds in my local area, which, you know, kingfish, I love kingfishers, such cool birds, so much character. So the D500 fit the bill. Um, and that was, so that was my uh, next camera after the 5200. And then I, I found the limitations on that because it was a crop sensor, was its angle of view. It was a little bit shallow. 
and I wanted to really expand my uh, my scene. Um, and that's when I started looking into a full frame um, and looking at the camera I've got now, which is which has been my dream camera for you know for quite a number of years, which is the D850. Um, unfortunately, with the, with getting the D850, that meant I had to sell my motorbike, which I was pretty heartbroken about. But I knew it was a means to an end. Sure, sure. I love that motorbike. <laughs> what sort of bike was it? It was a Suzuki GSXR one thousand. Okay, yeah, yeah very so, nice. Yeah, yeah, it was. Oh, it was lovely. <laughs> Aftermarket exhaust just sounded bees knees. <laughs> uh, sounds sounds like uh, a little bit like your um your, your cherry red D five fifty two hundred. Pretty lady. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can hear me coming. How do you set yourself? a creative challenge what process do you go through in in setting those challenges for yourself here's another cannonball creative challenge well i'll keep i'll keep bowling them and yeah uh, you'll just yeah I'll, I'll try and knock them out but i think that's that comes from your peers there's okay. so many amazing artists for me it does there's, there's so many amazing artists out there that it's it's hard not to be inspired and motivated by what they what they put out you know and and, and show the world and say you know Here's my work. This is what I can do, and I look at. I kind of look at it as as a wee bit of a challenge. It's but it's so motivating to see what can be achieved. I'm, I, you know, I look up to these guys, and, and I'm not. I'm like, I'm not there yet, but I want to be one day. That's my motivation. Yeah. Where do you see yourself? I guess in a in a couple of years, in terms of your creative space, are you you're obviously looking to um, sort of drive. The, the creative skills and uh, I, I guess the, the the output, where do you see that going? Do you, is it a hobby? Is it something that you want to turn into a career? Is it something that you're just happy having as a, a side hustle? No, this is, this is definitely something that I'm pursuing as a career, 100%. 100%. Um, it's, I'm, I'm putting things in place. Certainly, you know, last year working in through, I guess the the NFT realm, yep. um, with having an you know my first exhibition with NFT Aotearoa last year as well. Mm-hmm. Got um, prints in a gallery up north. I've got one in my local print shop, uh, and I'm hoping to do an exhibition at my local art centre here as well. Nice. Um, so I'm just I'm slowly just trying to to build. The, the the name and put the name out there yeah. as, you know as I said at the beginning I'm, I'm trying not to really pigeonhole myself with seascape photography I yeah. love it that will always be my first love um, but I want the opportunity to also be able to put out another piece of work people say they see the name and they're like oh actually no we can recognise that that would be something that he would do because we've seen similar sort of stuff to that that he's done yeah yep. Um, so, you know, I've got the plan for this year of where I want to shoot and what I want to achieve from those shoots. I want them to be portfolio pieces of work. Whether the weather wants to play with me on that, I don't know. We're all, you know, with the outdoor One photography. thing we can never control is <laughs> yeah. <like> photography. <laughs> no, no, at all. Yeah, that's it. That's the problem, isn't it? It's the weather gods, isn't it? You could go to a location and, you know, you're just absolutely blessed. And then you go to the next location, it's just, you know, absolute dire. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, this is definitely um, this is definitely a career that I'm I'm pushing, pushing yeah. as hard as I can. Um, it's it's because my wife she's a she's full time work, I'm stay at home dad, right? So I'm looking after our little one, um, and I'm trying to get out as and 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 get my camera out and get down to the beach or go out and do astro as much as I possibly can. Yeah, right. While still trying to get some sleep. <laughs> hold my head together a wee bit as well you know yeah I get, it's, a I get fine, it. it's a fine balancing act i think yeah how, how are you finding that balancing act i mean you've got a uh a very young child how young she's just over six months yeah okay so um you should be through most of the the, the sleep deprivation <laughs> yeah fortunately well it was we yeah it was it was tough and it was obviously you know it's not so it's it's hard for me, but it's not that hard. 
yeah. just because Chloe, you know, she has to, she had to go through and do all the feeding, nighttime feeding and things like that. Yep. Um, I, obviously things I can't do. I was still working full time, so I had to um, try and get as much sleep as I could. Yep. Chloe was concerned for my safety because I was still riding a motorbike at the time, not yeah. the Jitsar, but I had a different motorbike. So she would sleep in the spare room with the baby and do all that stuff while I slept in our room so I could still get a good night's sleep. And she would be in the knowledge then that I wasn't riding into work with the potential of coming coming a cropper, you know. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. So it's it's been it's been it's been difficult trying to um to balance that in the early stages for sure. Right. It's even still difficult now though, um, because I tried to do two nights astro back to back. Yeah, and I'm still I'm still beat up from it. I'm still <laughs> I'm still knackered. Yeah, no, you never quite get the, that sleep back. <laughs> well, the, 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 I'm, I'm putting. Do you know what I'm putting it down to? I'm putting not down, putting it down to the baby. You know, she gets blamed for a lot, but we'll, we won't blame her for that. I'm I wasn't it, talking about the baby. I'm <laughs> talking about Astro. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll put it down to I'll put it down to my age. Yeah, we'll, we'll go yeah, with it. We'll enough. go with the age. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll play that trump card, baby. Eh? So, in terms of that balance, what what strategies are you using to to get that balance? Is it spending more time with uh, at home and with family? I guess to counterbalance the the nights that you're uh, up at stupid o'clock trying to yeah. shoot stars. Yeah, um, I, I'm spe- I spend I'm here all day anyway. Yeah, yeah, my daughter, she never misses out. You know, she's got you know dad with her from when she wakes up to when she goes to sleep. Um, I, and I try to make sure that she's got the best of me, of course. Yep. Um, it's so it's it's not been it's not been that hard to balance those oh. two things in that respect. Um, with my wife, I don't know, probably could do, probably could do more. Uh, but Astro is it's. You know, because we're in summertime as well, we've got the later nights and the early mornings. Winter time, it won't be such an issue. Yeah, yeah. Because it's obviously darker. The, the longer nights, Mike. Yeah, that's, you've got, yeah, you've got more time to play around then. You can always head head down the South Island and get a little bit more time too. <laughs> there you go. Hey, now you're talking. <laughs> so when did photography become that target for you to be a career what what was it that sort of changed in in your mind because obviously starting out with a point and shoot and, mm. and so forth it probably never entered your mind at that time that you could think about making a career out of it what changed for you that actually made it a reality yeah well looking back it was always going to be secondary to having a full-time job you know I was always going to maintain being in the workforce mm-hmm until it got to the point where it was going to be a case of either I'm going back to work or Chloe's going back to work. Yep. Chloe's the wage earner. So unfortunately it meant that she had to go back to work. And then I had to really think about, you know, and and we knew this for a couple of years um, and I had to really think about, okay, well, I need to start really, I guess, you know, putting the hammer down with a, my education, you know, understanding the photography world Mm-hmm. trying to involve myself in it a little bit more um, and putting those things together so that when the time came for Chloe to go back to work, I'd, I'd have a, a, a bit of a brand. People would start to know me, hopefully. they yep. start to recognise the name, uh, maybe see some of my local work within the local area. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> hasn't quite planned out that way just yet. <laughs> I'm ever hopeful. Yeah, get, getting to be known is uh, a, a difficult thing. Yeah, it's yeah, and unfortunately, I didn't go to marketing school, so uh, the the marketing aspect and the marketing side of things um, is something probably a lot of us really struggle with because um, it means like putting yourself out there, you know, putting Absolutely. your voice out there, yeah. put your face out there, you know, kind of you're kind of standing up and amongst the crowd and putting your hand up and saying, you know, look at me, come and check my work out, you know. You know, come and interact with me and talk to me about you know this this piece here or this piece here or whatever it may be. You know, mm. so you kind of have to put yourself out there a wee bit, which I've never been. Ironically, I've never been fully comfortable with. I say ironically because my main career when I was um, a wee bit younger was I was a uh, I worked in fitness, 
Mm -hmm. I was a full-time personal trainer or gym manager, you know, one of those two forms for over 13 years. Yep. So I was always, you know, working in the fitness game. You know, I was a group fitness instructor. I was always putting myself out there. But there was something niggling that never, you know, felt fully comfortable with it, per se. Yep. Um, and then landscape, seascape photography came along, and it's like, hey, I'm out here by myself. That's <laughs> something, you know. It's well, just... most, most landscape photographers and astrophotographers in particular are uh, introverts, aren't they? <laughs> You're quite solo artists. Yeah, absolutely. I was like, what took me so long to find this, you know? <laughs> uh... How would you, you, you mentioned, you know, sort of trying to create that brand and that style. How would you describe your style? Obviously, the long exposure seascape is uh, a big part of your signature from my perspective. But mm. it, would you describe yourself that way or would you would you not? I think I'd, st yeah, I'd still describe myself primarily and specifically is a seascape photographer uh, long particularly and I tried to coin a term it never really took off I don't know if anyone noticed it and it was uh, on one of my recent um, NFT campaigns that I ran um, and and the, the premise around those it was three images and the design around those images was that there were five plus minutes in exposure time yep and they all they all had and I named them the, the name of each image was the length of their time and ex, you know their exposure time. Sure, sure. And I called that and I tried to I tried to call that ULE photography or ultra long photography. Yep. Uh, sorry, ultra long exposure photography. Um, <laughs> I haven't seen anyone else use it yet. I'd love to see people use it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, anything over five minutes, that's what I class as ULE, I, you know. I, I've used the term or something similar to an extra extra long exposure yeah. or, or ultra long exposure. But, yeah, yeah. I mean, that that's the thing. I mean, there's there are some people that do that, you know, um, quite successfully in terms of, uh, you know, the the delivery of the images, mm. um, what they call them, though, I, I guess, you know, some people just call them long exposures. But to yeah. me, a long exposure is anything over about uh, a third of a second, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, that, yeah, exactly. Yeah, 100% for sure. But, uh, yeah. Uh, so in terms of the development of that style, where do you see that going? Is, it, is that something you're going to continue to to do and and um I, I guess develop beyond where it is now and uh, it doesn't necessarily mean taking longer and longer exposures because <laughs> some sometimes that doesn't actually do anything it doesn't work. Yeah, you know. <laughs> i've done a few 20 minute exposures but, uh, yeah all right um the, the the seascape stuff will definitely always be there um, mm. for me, there's 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 a grounding to seascape photography, um, and I and I guess you know the, the, you know there's that time to you know allow the brain to just relax because my brain can just like I, I find that difficult switching off, particularly at night time. Yep. I have a tendency to overthink things mm -hmm. when I'm when I'm by the ocean and when I'm staring out across the sea. And I'm waiting for that sun to come up. That's all I'm thinking about. I'm not thinking about anything else. Nothing else is going through my mind. Sure. I have my feet in the ocean and I'm feeling just, you know, I'm feeling grounded and connected in that moment. And that's important to me um, because it just, it just sort of balances things out and redresses and maybe, I guess, you know, just rewires my brain a wee bit again and just gives it a little bit, just maybe a wee bit of time off from overanalyzing and overthinking. Um which can, which unfortunately it can prevent me from doing certain things in my life because it can mean I don't want to I don't want to venture. As sad as this sounds, it it can stop me from leaving the house. Yeah, yeah. Um, if it if it gets bad, if I don't do something about it, mm. so I've got to be quite careful in that respect. Um, with maintaining, I guess you would say, mental that mental health side of things. Yeah, absolutely. So seascape has to be front and center, not not just for that reason, but obviously for the enjoyment of it as well. Mm, yeah. Well, I don't. I don't think anyone would do it if they didn't love it. You know, no, yeah. Standing, yeah. standing in the dark, up to your knees in uh, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. Fortunately, I'm on the east coast of uh, Auckland in New Zealand. Yeah. And, um, we don't generally tend to have to worry too much about swells and big waves. Yeah, no. So you're, you're, you're usually all right, you know, whereas on the west coast, yeah, you, you've you got to be careful. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, it's a it's a bit like that here in Sydney on, on the east coast here. Yeah. yeah, you can go and, you know, go into Botany Bay or Port Hacking or... Hmm. Some somewhere where it's a, a little calmer, but uh, yeah, if you're on a on a rock shelf, you've got to get yeah, that, yeah, and, yeah, absolutely, and, yeah. And safety is an absolute critical must do. You know, you've got to make sure that you're uh, you're keeping yourself safe. Yeah. How would you define success with your photography? Oh God, how would I define success? I think when I see an evolution in my skill set. When I can see, when I can look back, like as I was saying with, you know, the point you shoot, like back in 2018, well, it was five years ago, and I look back even like 2018, 2019, you know, I can see that succession in progress. That's a snippet of success. You know, success is obviously, you know, it's it's a grand word, um, encompasses so much, but that's that's definitely definitely a good thing. I think success um is it affording me the ability to to do what I'm doing now um in the position that we're in also my wife affording us me the ability to do this as well <laughs> we have to acknowledge that of course yep. um you know it's, so a, a measure of success would be that people are you know they're seeing my images and and at some point you know people are going to start to recognize that's Paul Belli I, I, I that looks like a Paul Bella, that would be amazing. Or someone comes up and says, "Oh, I saw your image, such and such." You know those types of that. That's that's. I mean, you've got obviously monetary success, monetary success. That's that's a given, of course. Yeah. I want yeah. you know who doesn't want to make. Of course, I'm here to make money. At the end of the day, I've yeah. got to make money into the house, household. I've got you know my wife can't support us both all the time. I've got yeah. to put finances in. So obviously, I've, there's the monetary aspect, but. Um, the evolution of my skill set, um, the evolution of my photo photographic eye, the diversity that maybe I can start to present in my portfolio as well, um, which I'm, I think I'm expanding quite. I think personally, I think I'm expanding quite well. You know, I'm starting to branch out and do a little bit of architectural, sort of black and white, fine artish, I guess you'd call it work. Mm -hmm. The astral um, star trails, um, which still incorporates a little bit of seascape in there as well yeah yeah sure um so yeah I, I would probably define those as probably key indicators of success you you mentioned you live uh around auckland you're obviously not from auckland what prompted the the move from uh scotland to to auckland What's yeah that all started in 2005 um my wife is in the background, so I'll just I'll talk quietly so she doesn't hear me talking about another woman. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was um I, I met a Kiwi girl uh while I was working in London. Mm -hmm. She was a personal trainer. I was a personal trainer, so we moved in similar sort of circles. Um my flatmate was good friends of hers. She came over to the flat. At the time, sorry, this was in London because I wasn't in Scotland at the time. I'd been out in Scotland okay. for a few years. Yep. And we got, you know, we got to talking, we went on a date, you know. She had to come back to New Zealand because her sister was having a baby. And we made the decision that I would come out here and we'd try and make it go with the relationship. And that was in 2005. The relationship broke down a couple of years later. Mm -hmm. uh, but fortunately, I was, you know, permanent resident by then. So it was all, it worked out for, we're still, we can still talk, there's no drama there, but yeah, it worked yeah. out quite well, you know, it was, because I, I couldn't have imagined leaving this country, absolutely yeah. couldn't have imagined it, um, and then 2010, I met Chloe, um, yeah. but before all that, I mean, we left Scotland when I was 21, um, okay. yeah, it was, I love my hometown, I'm um, from a place called Largs, which is just on the west coast of Scotland, little seaside town. Yep. Picture, you know, it's like picture postcard type seaside town. Yeah. Which is probably why I love being by the sea, being by the ocean. Um, but it was starting to go downhill a wee bit. Drugs were starting to become a bit of a problem. Um, and my mum didn't want us being in that environment and growing up in that environment. 
Sure. Uh, where George was just be, becoming a little bit too prolific. And of all places, we ended up moving to Milton Keynes. Okay. You, you know Milton Keynes, you know, roundabout city, you know. Yep, yep. It wasn't actually too bad. Not too bad. Um, spent a few years there. Uh, got my personal training diploma. Ended up moving to London. Um, and I was a personal trainer there for you know, two and a half years before yeah, making that move out here. Cool. How do you think where you live now influences how you shoot it obviously influences what you shoot in terms of seascapes and some of the landscapes uh you know because if you you're shooting locally that's always going to be an element has that influenced how you shoot at all or does how you shoot influence what you shoot and i guess you know partly also where you live Mm, I think, yeah, definitely the environment has probably, I would sway more, you know, it being a bigger influence on what I shoot and how I shoot. Mm. Um, being surrounded by, you know, the sea, whether it's east coast or west coast. Um, there's, there's, there's not that much woodland here to shoot. There's not that much access to get into Grand Vista landscapes, to go out and shoot Grand Vista landscapes in the you know, early morning fog or whatever it might be. Um, other, other than cityscape stuff, so yeah, it, it, it sort of like fell into place. But it would be definitely ab- ab- absolutely seascape stuff, and you know, obviously the wildlife stuff that I dabbled a wee bit in as well. Yeah, yeah. What are your favourite locations? What What's your your favourite? You know, without giving directions in your secret <laughs> spots. But, uh, well, Hold on a minute. I've just got the coordinates down here. Let me just read them out. <laughs> we, you can pass them to me later. <laughs> where, 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 where do you like to go? What, what sort of places? If it's, if, if I can just go out and it's like half an hour, 45 minutes away, just, you know, maybe an hour's drive, it's probably going to be West Coast. Um, mm. Unfortunately, due to the cyclone and the devastation, um, those areas are shut off for people yeah. other than residents now. You know, they've gone through just absolute... Oh, it's just... I've seen some videos and it's just horrific. Yeah. Um, but that would be the West Coast, probably Murawai would be my go-to West Coast beach. Um, Kari Kari, another West Coast beach. Those would be my sort of like go-to locations. Mm. If I was able to freely travel without any concern or thought of having a six month old and just tighten a little bit with the money, it would be the South Island somewhere. It would be somewhere in the South Island, probably Fjordland, Milford Sound. Yeah. I did want to talk to you a little bit about uh, the effects of the cyclone because that's, you know, only, only recently sort of, I know the cleanup's still going on and I know, you know as you said, there's road closures and so forth. How did how did that affect you? And did you you know did did you experience any any hardship yourself? No, none at all. Um, unfortunately, for, for thank God, we had the a little bit of um, water ingress in our garage, but nothing major. Um, relatively speaking, of course, because um, we're at the top of our street where we live. Yeah, right. So we had yeah we had. I mean, it was like a river running down a road. I could have got, if I had a kayak, I could have got it out and I could have sailed off down to the, my local beach. <laughs> it would have taken me all the way down there. It, oh, was, yeah. it, was, it was that first, yeah, that first one. And then the cyclone came through and just compounded the problem again. Yeah. So we, were, we, were, we were fine. We were fine where we are. Yeah, we didn't really have any problems. My, my wife's um, family up there up north, they had, they've had some issues flooded paddocks, obviously road closures, bridges being wiped out, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. How's, in, in your opinion, I guess, how how's things going with the recovery efforts? Oh, that's a loaded question. <laughs> like, without getting too familiar. <laughs> oh, dear. I've... My question is, or would be, where's the military? Yeah. Why is why is the military not being deployed to help out? Why the, these the military branches have expert divisions that can deal with disaster and disaster relief. We send them all around the world yep. to do these kinds of things. 
we've got a we've got a natural disaster at home. Where's the military? Yeah. Why are they not out there putting up those temporary bridges that they can do in a day? You know, the engineer engineering regiment, I think it is. Yeah. They can, that's what they train for. That's what they specialize in. Yeah. That would be my question is where's the military? Mm. Yeah, well, I know uh, it, here in Australia with the, the flood recovery, it, I won't say it was immediate, and I'm not saying I, I'm, I'm not going to point fingers at uh, the, the politicians, mm. et cetera. Yep. So, you know, there's many that have uh, argued that the response was too slow, but I do yep. know that the military was uh, utilised and their, their specialist units were, as, as well as some, you know, Grunt infantry units. Where, yep. where, 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 <laughs> You've got to have them. Yeah. You've got to have them. That's right. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I mean, I guess it, it it does beg the question as to why they wouldn't be deployed in uh, in that situation. Yeah, I know they were, but there was only, there, there, were, there, were, guard, there were like manning checkpoints and mm-hmm. handing out, they were bringing in water, which is, of course, these are essential items, absolutely 100%. But the, these guys are, as I say, these guys are trained for disaster relief. We've yep. got a natural disaster on our doorstep. You know, it's right here. Yeah, I, I, yeah, that would be my question. Yeah, fair enough. Let's get back to the photography, though. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Before we tread on a landmine. Yeah. I used to. <laughs> What's the most notable experience you've had uh, out shooting? It, it wasn't one it wasn't one shooting experience it was two weeks it was two weeks of, uh, of shooting yeah it right was, um it was my wife and my wife and I had planned this trip around the south island and we bought this camper van so we got this nice little you know it was an older camper van but it, you know it did the trick um and we'd like planned our inventory you know our um schedule you know we we're gonna stay you know get the ferry over, South Island, we're going to stay in the South Island. It was two weeks of just, it was my, the best holiday I've ever had. I, I call it a holiday. I mean, it was, I guess, a, you could call it a planning holiday because it it showed me things mm-hmm. that I have to, you know, I've, I've now, I've got A on my hard drive because I've got the, the photos from it, but I've also got B locations that I need to revisit in the South Island. Yeah, right. Utilise more because... It was as as amazing as a trip it was. I would have liked to have spent more time in certain locations. I didn't mm-hmm. really get to spend too much time, like in Milford Sound, for instance. Yeah. Franz Joseph was just amazing, but we didn't really have, you know, if we'd had a week there at Lake Matheson, oh, just it's just all so gorgeous and amazing, you know. Yeah. So yeah. two and and further up, I guess the um, east coast of the South Island as well. Uh, sorry, west coast of the South Island, because we turned in off Greymouth and came back inland. Yep. I don't know if you've done that 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 uh, that track. I haven't been to the South Island yet. So okay. I've, I've been to been to Auckland, been to Wellington, yep. uh, and a couple of bits and pieces, a bit of the Coromandel, but uh, never nice. been to the South yep. Island yet. Yeah. So I'd say yeah, I'd say that that the the, whole, the, the combination of that whole two week trip was. An experience, and it's. I'd love, love to do it again. I want to get another camper van. I'd absolutely, but with the baby, <laughs> yep, <laughs> I, I it. <laughs> it would be a wee bit tricky. I think. Yeah, I, I definitely get it. <laughs> we had the dog with us, so that was awkward. Yeah, I can imagine. What about what about any horror stories? Everyone has a a, a shocker now and then. What a, what what's been your worst experience? I guess. I think, I think my worst experience is looking back at my original photos that I started <laughs> taking in 2018. I think that's my horror story. Uh, to be honest, I've been I think I've been quite fortunate. Um I've had I haven't had any the, the only the only I guess issues or problems that I really have, they're not really horror stories. It's the same that you know we all have when we're shooting down at the beach, shooting landscapes as as other people. You know, walking in front of your camera, yeah, and, that yeah. kind of thing. and you're like, can you not see the tripod? Like, I, I get, I don't own the beach. We none of us own the beach. It's a free space, a hundred percent. But if I saw, if I saw a tripod and a camera, I'd walk behind the person. You know, yeah. Fortunately, most of the time I'm doing long exposures, so they're ghosted out anyway. And it's kind of like, come on, you know. 
I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Can control your dog. Don't let your jo- dog jump on the tripod. For well, time. yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I haven't had that either. Fortunately, as I say, it's it's been it's been pretty crazy for me so far. I really need to touch a lot of wood around here just to. I'm not jinxing myself. <laughs> nice to hear. What have you learned about the world through photography? That there's so much more that I haven't seen. I've travelled a bit. Um, you know, back in back when I was in the UK, uh, you'll probably know this as well. In the local newspapers, um, there's always deals on easy jet flights or ferry crossings, or so it's so easy to. Tr- it, well, it was so easy. I think now that the UK has left the EU, I don't think it's as easy anymore. I'm not sure how that is all working out. Um, but like back then for me, it was you know I could zip across to Holland. I could go to go to Spain, you know, yep. and it wasn't any drama, you know, go to North Africa. It was, it was, and you, and you could do it on the cheap as well. You could do it on a budget, but there's, 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 there's places around the world now where, because I'm watching these other, you know, big sort of YouTube personalities and I'm seeing these places that they go to and these guys are traveling all around the world to come to where I used to bloody live in Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> that's about that's that's like I, th- I think back and I think that's that's uh that's a big regret for me is that I didn't find photography sooner. Sure. My my hometown is a picturesque seaside town. It's banked it, on the on the left exit, you know, when you leave the town to the way you know on the right hand side when you leave the town by two rivers, the Noodle Burn and the Gogo Burn, and they go all the way up the hills. Yeah. I think it's from memory the Gogo Burn. It's when you follow that river up, you go through, you go through woodland. And you start, you start as you go higher up and further up. You get cascading waterfall after cascading waterfall after cascading waterfall. You turn left, you follow that part of the river. You're getting waterfall after waterfall. You turn right, you get waterfall after waterfall, and we get the snow as well, mm. and we get the ice, and it's just like and I'm thinking, I'm like, oh my god, I just. If I had my camera, oh my god! All these, you know, all these images start popping, popping in my head, and all the woodland, and oh, just the opportunity missed, I guess, you know. Yeah. Do you have any family back then? Yeah, yeah. Um, I've still got family in my hometown. A lot of my family sort of dispersed either um, oh. Edinburgh, um, uh, Windermere, um, High Wycombe, really random places. Windermere I can get, uh, but my mum's in High Wycombe, random. Okay. Yep. Um. So they're spread, yeah, they're spread sort of throughout the UK, but I am a few of my family still within that territory of where I'm from, yeah. Yeah, well, should should make a, a family visit. Might make it a bit cheaper. Well, yeah, well, that's it, yeah, free accommodation, eh? That's uh, it. <laughs> well, my wife has only met my uncle and my and his new wife, Belinda, and my mum. She hasn't met any of it. She hasn't met my brother, or so... So yeah. To be able to go back to the UK at some point would be, and obviously for everyone to meet uh, Sienna, uh, yeah, just be grand, you know. That'd be fantastic. Oh, it'd be yeah, be next level. Yeah. You mentioned photographing alone. Is that your preference, or do you like to shoot with other people? It's funny you should ask that, Grant. <laughs> when I was out shooting Astro the other morning, I was thinking to myself, "Man, I feel alone." <laughs> <laughs> I was out there at um, what was it just just before two a.m. until mm. six a.m. shooting down down um, shooting the star trails that I posted today, and um, and I was I was I was I was sitting there by myself because I've got a few few photographer mates that I go out shooting with now because I never used to I always used to go out and shoot by myself and, and yep. that was that was fine, but now that I've had the experience of company, when it's not there, you notice it. You know, yeah, yeah. So when I was out there, you know, shooting by myself, because with with um, time lapse photography as well, I'm setting my intervalometer up and I'm letting my camera do its thing. I'm not. That's it. You know, I'm I'm sitting back and I'm done. Yep, you're you're waiting for it to finish. I'm waiting for four hours <laughs> you know? in the dark on the train. <laughs> on, in the dark. Trying to find a, a nice rock to sit on because again it's igneous rock, so it's not exactly the most pleasant rock to sit on. Not, not comfortable, yeah. No, not at all. I took a foam pad with me just thinking I prepared for that. 
<laughs> so yeah, I, I always used to shoot alone. That was that was that was I, I, again. It was it was a centering thing as well for me. You know, some mindfulness also. Yeah. But now that I've gone out shooting with other guys um, and having that camaraderie, you know, that conversation, that banter. Um, yeah, when I was out shooting the other morning doing that Astro, I was like, oh, something's missing here. And I didn't like it, you know? Yeah. In terms of uh, the routine that you have when you're shooting, what are you... What are you looking for? What are you doing? What are you, um, you know, thinking about? I guess uh, it depends whether it's a day after shoot or, as I say, I've got I've got a calendar of um, fifteen locations that I want to shoot this year. Yep. Those locations though are more autumn winter shoots as opposed to um, some. One of them is a summer shoot, and that's a glowworm cave that I want to go in. I want to go and shoot, and glowworms are only, I think, active, um, are really quite active between December and March here. Yeah, right. Um, we are in March now, so I've got <laughs> not much of a window, but we did get hit with that cyclone, and that stopped us from travelling north. Mm. Um, so if it's if it's a day after shoot, uh, sorry, um, the day before shoot, I'm usually thinking about it and rat rattling my brain, thinking, where do I want to go? And it's... That's the kind of thing that I that will keep me awake at night. Yeah, uh, where do I want to go? I'm, I've I've already looked at the tides. I've already looked at the weather, and I've looked at the tides for multiple locations. Uh, yep. Whether it was west coast or east coast. Um, obviously west coast sunrises aren't great <laughs> for obvious reasons, but you can still get decent color, um, or black and white. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it, it depends whether it's long. If it's a long drawn out planned process, or if it's just the day before, um. But as I say, it's it's something that will keep me up up at night. Just trying to just trying to decide. I've got maybe five or six different locations I want to go to. And how do I want to compose? Because I know the area quite well now. How do I want to compose it? Um. Do I want to do now time lapses, or do I want to do long exposure, or? You know, all these little things. What lens do I, do I take my big lens with me? Because kingfishers are on the rocks from time to time as well. Yeah, right. So I can do, you know, once that sun comes up and I get a little bit more light, I can start to think about doing some wildlife stuff as well, you know. Mm -hmm. how, how long, how many hours or days would you spend planning a shoot? Well, the day before, not long. It's But it's I say not long, but it keeps me up at night. So it'll yeah. keep my brain ticking over. So I, I might I might plan like maybe half an hour on the computer, just checking things over. I might go onto Google Maps, maybe if it's a new location I've thought of, or I've seen somebody else has posted a, a picture somewhere, and I'm like, oh, okay, that looks quite interesting. I'll, you know, I'll, let me look at that and have a look at that and see what other composition variables there are with this this spot. Yeah. Uh, then yeah, I'll spend a bit more bit more time with it. But if it's my local area, it'll be literally half an hour on the computer, just checking things over, checking ties that, you know, checking the weather, all that kind of stuff. Mm. And then the brain at night time for another couple of hours, you know. And then if it's the longer stuff, um, it'll probably be a week to two weeks out that I'll start looking at that location. Some of the locations I'm going to be shooting with other people, so I have to organise that with them as well. Yeah, right. So we have to go through that planning stage of, when they're available and when I'm available and matching up diaries and, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. hmm. What about once you've actually got the shots, are you straight into editing and getting them out there as quick as you can or are you one to take a little bit more time and spend, uh, you know, days or weeks sitting on images before you get into them? I can't sit on them. <laughs> yeah, I can't sit on them. When I start to see the images come through in the back of the, you know, in the in the live view, I, I'm just like, oh, oh, that looks. I can't wait to see that on the big screen and start, you know, you know, because we shoot raw, you know, we want we want to start bringing all, and not only do we shoot raw, but we also have, I guess, a mental visualization or a mental image or a picture of how we want to translate what we saw on that shoot to how we then bring that raw image to life on the yeah. computer screen and then present that 
this is, hey guys, this is this is what I took. I was here and this is what I saw and this is how I want to present it to you. Oh. Um, so no, I can't I can't sit on images. I might <laughs> at the most like with the with the Star Trail stuff, because there's so much data, there's so much information, there's so much time spent with processing. Yeah, right. That can take a couple of days. So mm. that might delay me in processing the next lot of Star Trail stuff, which has done with these last these last two shoots that I've done. Yeah. Uh, because one of the shoots was like, I think, 726 images that I had to sort out and go through and process. Um, and then the next one, the night before, I think it was the 1st of March, was 204 that I had to sort out. Yeah. Uh, but I try and do it as quick as I can because I'm like a kid in a candy shop. I can't, I can't sit on it. No, absolutely not. I can't sit Fair on enough. it. <laughs> once, once you've uh, started, what are you, what are you doing to the images? What's, what's the processing workflow look like? It depends. Well, yeah, I mean, it depends how how I've shot them. If I've shot them bracketed, um, that'll be different to obviously how I shoot. You know, a single exposure. Um, but it's you everything starts in Lightroom for me. I use Lightroom as my base editing platform. Yep. Most of my workflow is in edit um is edited through Lightroom. Um I do probably I would say 90% of my workflow in Lightroom, and the 10% then is then done finishing up and tidying things up and cleaning things up in Photoshop. Yeah. If I want to add like a gradient or a little bit of an autumn glow or something like that. Yep. You can do it in Lightroom, but it's not as effective, I find, as doing it in Photoshop. So it's yeah. just, and then depending on what I want to do with the image, I've got um, a Gigapixel Topaz AI um, yeah. enhancement stuff. So I can, if I want to blow it up big, then I can use those tools as well. And if I just want to clean things up a wee bit or, you know. Yeah, fair enough. And talking about blowing things up big, is that for print or? Is, yeah. Yep. So uh, how much of your work do you do you print? I've got a printer at home. Um, so mm. I've got the um, Canon Pro 300. Yep. So I can do prints of up to A3+. Plus. Um, yeah, okay. That's a great print. I love it. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's quite pricey. Inks aren't cheap. It's like, what is that, 37 bucks per cartridge and it takes 10 cartridges. Ten cartridges, yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. And the paper itself, you know, it can, you know, paper can be like 200 plus for 10 sheets. Yep. Depending, you know, if you go for that sort of like high-end, Hanamule, metallic, you know. Um, so I do most of my printing at home. If I do want to print big, then I'll use my local print shop. And I did that for my, that NFT Aotearoa exhibition I did last year. Yeah, right. I printed um, three of my images and then, so printed and framed, they were 150 centimetres by 100 centimetres. So these things were, they're, 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 they're pretty, pretty dominating size wise. Um, so that's the only time I'll really use those to upscale. Yeah. Other, th other than that, it's just straightforward Lightroom Photoshop. Done. Yeah. Cool. Cool. In terms of prepping your images for printing, are you doing anything special or are you fairly confident with how you've got everything calibrated? Yeah, I'm pretty confident now. Um, I'll use the ICC profile for that specific paper. Yep. I won't always use it, um, but obviously that ICC profile for that paper is there for a reason. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as the printing is concerned, Certainly makes it easier than trying to work yeah. it out yourself. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you go through the whole menu and the whole feed of different options and it's like, nah, I don't like that, I don't like that. And this, as I say, this paper isn't cheap, you know, and the ink isn't cheap. So yeah, you, you don't want to be practising a lot. No, no. Well, if you do it, you're only doing it on six before or something like that, you know, you're yeah. just keeping it small. <laughs> Trouble is, when you do it small, you can't see the details then as well. Yeah, it's a, a double-edged sword a wee bit, you know. Yeah. Um, so now printing, I'm 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 pretty comfortable with doing it at home up to that A3 plus size. Yeah, absolutely. And I've got a nice little collection of fine art paper as well. Nice, nice, mm. nice. What about creative walls? Have you ever hit one? And if so, how have you handled that? The, I think the creative wall that I hit was probably during lockdowns, just because of the strict. You know, we couldn't go anywhere, couldn't do anything, um, and. You know, obviously, I can't go. I can go out and shoot my landscape or seascapes. You know, 
Um, and that's where I guess you start to your brain starts to take over. It's like, what can I do with my camera? What else can I shoot? You start looking in your garden. You start looking at the flowers. And and this is this is and this is a good lesson anyway. You know, is is don't forget to look down at your feet. There's there's there's, there's, there's always something to photograph. It doesn't matter if you do the night sky or you do grand vistas and this that and the next thing. If you're stuck with a little bit, a little bit of you know, you, you can't get out of a rut. Or say, look down at your feet. Go and do something different. Go and shoot something different. Try a different genre of photography. Get the juices flowing again and get the education going again. I find that you know, as I learn things and I learn new tricks and learn new tools, I just I want to get out there and I want to I want to put them into practice. I want to see how they translate. I want to see how I can translate them. Can I can I mimic what I saw? Do I want to mimic what I saw? Can I can I evolve it? Mm-hmm. Um, I think I think there that's quite important to. As, as I say, I don't want to pigeon, must pigeonhole myself as a seascape photographer. I do want to try other genres of photography. And as I say, that comes with educating myself. No, that's great. Where do you see photography going uh, in the future? Oh, that's a big question for me. <laughs> I, I probably don't have a concise answer for that, I'm afraid, Grant. I, I really, I mean, photography is always going to be there. Obviously, mm-hmm. we've got the um, the input now of and the collaboration between, I guess you call traditional photography and AI. Yep. Um, and the, the the combination of of those those two artistic forms, um, and I think that's definitely going to progress further down the track. I think there's always going to be obviously a need and a fulfillment requirement for for I guess what you call now traditional photography. Um. Yeah, I can't sort of like visualize where I would where I see it further down the track, but I don't see it really I see it inheriting AI and bringing that into the fray. Okay. Yeah. I think traditional photography will stay as it is. But what changes with tech? I don't know. I mean yeah. you know, because we've gone from film to digital, point and shoot digital, you know, like 1.3 megapixel cameras or whatever, up to these like, you know, like the Fujifilm GFX 100 S, you yeah. know, megapixel Leviathan. Um, you know, we've gone from you know DSLRs to mirrorless. Um, you know, we've gone from standard lenses to tilt shift lenses. It's yeah. like, yeah, I mean, it's good that it evolves. A hundred percent, it's great that it evolves. But I think yeah. we've got to be careful not to take the people element out of it. I, I, I totally out. agree because the, the the tool being used is only a tool. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It might help you change some of your creative choices, but <laughs> it's still just a tool and you need to have the skills to use the tool in an appropriate way and in a way that's creative and helps you enjoy what you're doing because yeah. if you don't enjoy it, you're going to stop doing it. Yeah, that's that, exactly, 100%. <laughs> I agree. Uh, what do you see as the biggest challenge facing photographers right now? Oversaturation, I think. I think with social media. Social media has been great in one hand. But it's all, it'll also take away in the other. I think uh, it's it's almost like too much of a good thing. You know, you keep you keep you know before social media, you'd look in a photo book, or you'd go to a library and you'd open someone's book and you'd look through the images and you'd be like you'd be blown away. Yeah, you know, you're seeing these images every day. Mm. Uh, I think I think that's probably the biggest problem. I think is oversaturation, um, and it also then I guess one one big problem for me and I um. And it's, it's something to be very careful of and very mindful of. And it's something that Nick Page talks about a lot, which is geotagging. Um, and be very careful of geotagging. If you find, you know, this idyllic spot that's just pristine and it's glorious, let's try and keep it that way. Don't right. tag your location. And that that that's that's not just photographers. That's for Instagrammers and that's everyone, you know. Yeah, no, I totally. Well, because, because of social media and, you know, being able to travel so freely and you know around the world and go here, there, and the next, the next place. It's um, you know these little these little treasures are few and far between now. What do you like to do when you're not out shooting? Um, well, I used to be a competitive powerlifter, okay. so going to the gym was pretty important to me. I say used to be, <laughs> used to being the operative words. 
unfortunately. <laughs> and and I need to I need to get back into it again. I need to um my wife my wife actually bought me a membership, a gym membership at the one of our local gyms. And I and I started getting back into it. This sounds ridiculous coming from an ex-personal trainer, of course. But it's you know <laughs> it's easy. It's easy well, to at least you know what you're doing when well, you Yeah, exactly. It's easy to fall off the wagon. It's hard to get back on it again. It's the reverse yeah. of something else. I, you know? I know that feeling. <laughs> yeah. And and because I was quite I was actually, you know, a pretty decent um pretty decent power lifter within my class. Mm. Um, you know, I was a good sized block, you know, I was pretty pretty sizable, you know. Um, and that was uh it was it's some it's definitely something I missed that um that tightness feeling that you get when you're, you know, you've got a lot of muscle in your frame. Yeah. Just yeah. because I've lost, you know, a majority of that muscle off my frame, I, I'm, I'm aware, I'm very aware of it. And I'm very aware of my fitness when I'm out on a shoot and there's a requirement for tracks or whatnot, you know, and I'm, so I'm, I'm very aware of uh, fitness, cardiovascular fitness um, with my photography as well. It's a reminder that, oi, sort yourself out, son, you know. Yep, yep, I know what you mean. <laughs> we all have inspirational and aspirational photographers. Who do you think I should be talking to uh, in, in future episodes? There's a couple of characters in the UK, um, and I really I really enjoy his landscape photography. Uh, yeah. I really enjoy his personality. He's a, he's a great character. He's got a YouTube, you know, he's a pretty good YouTube, pretty decent YouTuber as well, of course. Mm. Um, there's, 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 I guess there's three from the UK, probably, I would say. And there's one who's now relocated from the western side of Canada to the eastern side of Canada. That's um, Gavin Hardcastle. Yep. Yeah, he's a character. Um, but Mally Davis, I don't okay, know if yeah. you Mally Davis. and am uh, familiar with him and his yeah. work. Yeah, yeah, I, I love his woodland photography. Definitely, uh, yeah. and his, uh, you know, when he goes to the lakes and things like that, he just seems to get the conditions. I don't yeah. know, how, I don't know how he does it, and and um, probably going out every day doing it. Yeah, that will help. Yeah, you know, you go out seven days a week. One of them's got to be a winner, isn't it? That's it. <laughs> um, and I like, I really enjoy uh, Gary Goff's fine art photography. Uh, yeah, I like Gary's work too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so probably, yeah, probably Gavin, Mally and Gary, yeah. Well, thanks for that. Last question for you and uh, for everyone that listens, it's obviously the, the most important question we can ask. Do you like pineapple on pizza? <laughs> oh, dear. Here's, 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 here's little, a little thing for you. I'm actually Italian as well. <laughs> so that's a firm no. <laughs> that's, a def- that's a definite no. Meatballs, yeah, yes. Every Italian that's been on on the show has definitely been a a, a no. <laughs> yeah, it's a no. That's a hard no. Uh, fair enough. All right. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to me, Paul. Uh, I've really enjoyed spending a bit more time getting to know you better and learning more about what you do. Where can people find what you do? Thank you for having me, Grant. I really appreciate it. Um, it's been great to finally have a chat with you as well. Um, so I'm on uh, Twitter. That's Paul Belli Nine on Twitter. Instagram, Paul Belli Photography on Instagram, and Facebook, Paul Belli Photography on Facebook. I've got a website, paulbellifotography.com. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Matt. Cheers, Grant. Thanks, buddy. Thanks again for listening to Landscape Photography World. I hope you enjoyed the show and keep listening because I'll be joined by some great guests in upcoming episodes. You can find my work in this podcast at grantswinburnphotography.com. I'm also on Vero, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram and Facebook. I'm Grant Swinburne. Hope to see you out shooting soon.